All right, um, so happy Tuesday. We have three weeks left in this class. Um, and today it is my um, absolute pleasure to introduce Peter Adkinson, um, who I, I think is a storied figure in the game industry, um, both digital and tabletop game industries. I, I, I don't think that one could look at games in the 20th century without, um, and 21st century without looking at the impact of Peter and his work on the industry. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Peter was one of the founders of Wizards of the Coast. Um, he was essential to their acquisition of Magic the Gathering and also central to their acquisition of Dungeons and Dragons when they later got it in the late 90s. As this is a class on role-playing games, I was really excited to ask Peter if he could join us and he, he agreed graciously to be here. So it's wonderful to have you here today, Peter. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is just like, for those of you who weren't living through the second edition days of Dungeons and Dragons, um, part of what was happening, at least to my understanding in the back of things was that TSR Hobbies, the company that previously been publishing the game was kind of in a rocky position and having a lot of trouble with the creative vision moving forward out of second edition. And so when um, Wizards of the Coast acquired uh, TSR and acquired Dungeons and Dragons, they really renovated the game itself and turned it into more of the game uh, that we have today. Not, to I mean, they, they also made the game that we have today, but I think they're really instrumental for modernizing it, pulling it out of the 1980s, pulling it out of the 1970s, and pulling it towards this sort of philosophy of modern game design. So anyways, Peter, I'm just gonna let you talk. Thank you so much for coming to speak to the class today. All right, well, Aaron, thank you for the delightful introduction and thank you all for having me here join your class today. This is fun. I always dreamed of being a teacher actually to be a uh, true confessions. And um, so every once in a while I get invited to speak to a class. And so I'm uh, excited to be here. <clears throat> so yeah, um, I assume there's a class on role-playing games. You all are pretty well versed, I assume, on what role-playing games are and what Dungeons and Dragons is and all that sort of stuff. So, and Wizards of the Coast. And the Wizards of the Coast is known for being the publishers of Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, and for a while, Pokemon. Uh, some people might forget that. It was a while back. We were the company that brought uh, the Pokemon cards to America and to most of the rest of the world outside of Japan. And Wizards also has done a lot of other projects along the way, uh, some forgettable, some unfortunately forgotten, and some I think still around perhaps, I'm not sure. <clears throat> anyway, and um, so, but getting to that point is a story that has a lot of twists and turns, and I'm so, you know, I'm proud that I got to be a part of that story, and so I will tell you that story, uh, sort of a, you know, an abbreviated version of that story, but with kind of a focus around role playing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about magic, even though magic plays a big part in the story. Um, so one thing to know is that I am, even though I'm a businessman and an entrepreneur, because I, I landed in, in this, I'm a gamer at heart. I mean, I, I love games. I grew up in a family of games, not role-playing games. They didn't exist back when I was a kid, but, you know, we played things like Pinochle and chess and checkers and, you know, but we did it avidly. And uh, so when I was a teenager, I, uh, I got into um, military war games. I don't know if you're familiar with this genre, but it's war games that simulate various battles throughout history that are played uh, on paper and uh, like tabletop games with hexagonal grids and chits that you move around representing the forces. My dad was in the military, so this was a natural sort of, of fit for us. And I was uh, quite um, a, a fan of these games. We had a lot of them. And then one year in 1978, I was 17 years old. I was standing at a game store and I had the newest big war game in my hand and I looked on the counter and there was the advanced, uh, the Dungeons and Dragons uh, starter box of that era. The start. And um, I had no idea what it was. I, I, I had, I was familiar with fantasy because my brother had just given me a copy of The Hobbit to read and I read it in a day. And then I read the Lord of the Rings series and the rest of the weekend. And so I was, I had this newfound love of fantasy and I saw this dragon on the box and I thought, oh, 
I'm going to get that instead. So on impulse, I bought that Dungeons and Dragons game. And wow, did it change my life because <clears throat> I immediately, immediately became a fan of Dungeons and Dragons and, and drank the role-playing Kool-Aid. Now, it wasn't, you know, this was back before people knew Dungeons and Dragons was cool. I mean, it was, there was nothing cool about Dungeons and Dragons in 1978. Well, it was cool, but just nobody realized it, right? And so Dungeons and Dragons, um, it was, I was definitely a geek and, um, uh, you know, ha had the, had the lifestyle of being, you know, mocked and teased about what I did in school, you know, and um, uh, it was, it was a lonely life, but um, it was, it was a lot of fun. And that passion uh Sort of, I, I very quickly became a dungeon master, started making, creating my own world called Chaldea, and which I've been working on ever since, and started running for all my friends. And of course, nobody knew what it was. So most people, I was teaching them what it was at the time. And this is how I spent my, my, my high school, uh, late high school and early and most all my college years. And and then, so one fateful day in the mid '80s, sometime uh, we were hanging out, and we had just bought a new expand, a new adventure supplement that had come out by a company called Judges Guild, and it was called the City State of the Invincible Warlord or Overlord, excuse me. And I remember we started looking through this, and my friend Terry said, "Hey, you know, we could do this. You know, we we could make something like like this." and um, the other people in the group, Ken and I, myself and uh, Daryl, we were like, oh, I, I don't know, you know, and what we thought about, yeah, that'd be fun. We could start a game company and we could call it right away. We knew what we wanted to call it. So let's call it Wizards of the Coast. And the reason was, is because we had another buddy of ours who was running a D&D campaign that we were all players in. And he had a Wizards Guild in his campaign called the Wizards of the Coast. And these people were badass. I mean, these were terrifying. Like anytime one of them showed up on a battlefield, everybody's like, okay, back up. <laughs> and so there was a mystique about them. And then us being from the West Coast, you know, it's all added to it. So that there was no market research. That was the extent of any discussion there ever was about what the name of the company should be. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so um, and we talked about it a little bit more and eventually said, you know, maybe we should finish college first yeah maybe that's a good idea so uh, we put that idea to to rest and we went continued on with school and the idea was more or less forgotten um not really but every once in a while one of us would do something like make a uh, a flyer for a game or something like that and we just always put wizards of the coast on it and we, we didn't have a company really yet at the time and so then life goes on. I graduated from college in 1985. I moved to Seattle. Uh, my friend Ken, who was at that original meeting, he also moved to Seattle. And we were, um, we were techies. You know, I got a degree in computer science. I was working at the Boeing company as a systems engineer. And he was doing tech work somewhere. And he would figured out how, to, how we could talk by chat on our laptop computers through Boeing mainframes, you know, during the week. I mean, this was like a, most people didn't know how to do this. This was like an unusual thing. That we'd figured out how to do this. And we were, instead of working, we were chatting one day and I told him, I said, Hey, we should start Wizards of the Coast. And he's like, and it was just like long pause. Like they're like four or five minutes later. He's like, you're serious, aren't you? Like, yeah. And we got together and we decided to do it. Now we had no skill or experience in business or in the business of role-playing games and publishing, any, any of that. And by the way, I'm not saying this to recommend that's how you should start a company. <laughs> I'm always a little nervous telling the Wizards of the Coast story because there's certain aspects of the story that might seem to reward spontaneity and just going for it 
uh, without sort of, and so, so I feel like I need to work into this some of the cautions about it is good to do research and to get to finish college. I, we did do that at least, just not in, in perhaps in the correct field. And and sort of be, you know adoptive professional demeanor. So we uh, we did it. There was probably a dozen people who was were in my immediate circle of friends at the time. This is before social media, so your only friends were people you actually saw in person and hung out with and played games with. And I held a meeting and I got everybody to come. And we the the only thing we did in that first meeting was just brainstorm what if the if we could just make anything we wanted, what would we make? Of course, we were just thinking about role-playing games because that was our passion, even though Wizards is known for magic and many other things. And we decided that we didn't want to make our own role-playing game. That, and this is funny to say this, I can't say it with a straight face, but that in 1991, when we were having this discussion, 1990, when we were having a discussion, we agreed that there were too many role-playing games already in the market. <laughs> that, that, like, we, we, we don't need to do a role-playing game. Uh, so what we would do is we would make role-playing game supplements, materials, things, you know, um, adventures uh, that people could use with their own role-playing game that they already love. And, and so we started working on a bunch of role-playing products and there was, you know, a, a number of products that were, that people had ideas for and people said, I'll work on this, I'll work on that, you know, and then, but then, you know, who, we, we didn't have any money, of course. So we're, everybody's just doing this on their own time. Nobody's getting paid for this. And who actually starts coming up with manuscripts on things, you know, ended up being more like only about five things out of this list. And then as we got closer and closer to thinking that we might have something that we could actually publish, you know, it was really down to just one thing. And it was a book called The Primal Order. It was a book about um, role-playing gods in a D, &D in, in, in fantasy role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, but also GURPS and RuneQuest and the, the various role-playing games of the day. And we, um, uh, this, so, so this kind of became like, this was the, the product that had the most traction. And we sat down and, and like trying to, we were just writing this, you know, the other step I, that we're doing here is like, what does it take to actually make a role-playing game in those days? Because everything printed books, right? And none of us had any printed books sort of experience. So we just got books and looked at books and basically re-engineered. Well, okay, what's in a book, a role-playing book? There's text here. Okay, so somebody's got to write all this text. And then there's illustrations. Okay, so we need an artist to make all these illustrations that hopefully relate to the text. Um, there's some way of arranging this text. Um, like how does this text get arranged and laid out, basically layout sort of thing. And uh, Ken uh, happened to have some experience in that actually. And, uh, you know, in the art and the graphics, you know, we didn't really understand what the word graphics meant, but we were starting to, to, to get it. So we basically reverse engineered the entire process of how to make a book. And part of it was realizing that we needed an editor, somebody to come in and just kind of make sure that we got the grammar right. <laughs> yeah. So, and when we were about, we were thinking that we were maybe mere weeks from being able to publish this book, our editor, Beverly Marshall Salings. Now, Beverly actually had some actual experience in editing and she had a publishing arts degree from PLU, Pacific Lutheran University here in Washington. And she was like, um, <clears throat> this needs a lot of work. I mean, if you want it to be good, like if you just want somebody to fix the grammar, okay, you can do that, but um, don't put my name on it if that's all you want to do. I'll, I'll come in and fix the grammar for you, but this really needs a lot of work. Like, no, 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 we want it to be good. And so it turned out that we were a year away from publishing that product. And so we, you know, after working on it in a year, 
we had to kind of suck it up and realize that we had at least that much time left to, to really get the text to where it would it would it would do well. Well, along during that path, you know, we started in 1990, so now we're into uh, 1991. And in thinking, uh, as we're coming into 1991, I'm realizing, hey, we, you know, we may have figured out how to make a role-playing book here. And, you know, and we, we had like figured out that once we get to a certain pace, point where we have all this art manuscripts, we take it to a printer and they actually do the printing. Okay, good. How do we sell it? <laughs> I mean, I'm really embarrassed. We were a year into this before we asked ourselves the question of how do we sell this this book? Like, um, and so uh, we had no idea that game company. We didn't know anybody at a game company. We didn't. We knew who the game companies were, of course, because we bought their games and played their games. But we didn't know how to actually, um, you know, how business part worked. And because um, I'm like, how do you know, you know, like, how do we sell to all the retailers? How do we get in retail shops? Because really buying things by mail wasn't much of a thing in those. And, I mean, buying things by mail was a thing in, in American culture, but it wasn't a thing in, in tabletop games, really. Most games were bought at stores. So again, well, let's reverse engineer the process. I went to a game store and said, hey, how do you get your games? <laughs> like, where do you get them from? <laughs> I want to make a game. I want to sell it. <laughs> if you end up with it, sell it to you know your people. And this guy <laughs> kind of laughed and said, okay. Yeah. So he, he explained to me that there was this, this group of companies called distributors. And the distributors would buy the games from the publishers and turn around and sell the games to the retailers. And that this was really good for the retailers because the retailers could um, establish themselves with distributors and eventually have credit with the distributors and not have to deal with, you know, 30, 40 game companies in those days. Now it would be hundreds of game companies and could just really deal with one person, one company and get all their gaming needs filled. This made sense. And he said, listen, if you really, if you're serious about starting a game company, you need to go to Gamma. And I'm like, what's Gamma? He said, Gamma is the Game Manufacturers Association. It is a trade organization, which um, uh, now I didn't know what a trade organization even was in these days. But basically, in most industries, a trade organization is a typically a not-for-profit organization that helps businesses connect with each other in that uh, sector of industry. And they often have a trade show, which Gamma does. It's called the Gamma Trade Show. And in fact, I'm going to it in, uh, in a couple of weeks. It's in, it used to be in, in those days, it was Las Vegas. Now it's in Reno. And he says, you go to this place. They have all these seminars. They'll teach you everything you need to know about how to make games and how the three-tier distribution system works and how to, and you know where to go find template contracts for freelancers and just all this sort of stuff. And by the way, Gamma still does that. And this is, you know, if you are harboring thoughts of eventually publishing your own game, um, if you self-publish, that's one thing. But if you decide to, you know, get involved and make a company and sell to retail stores and stuff like that, or even if you do it yourself, I highly recommend Gamma is still the place to go uh, in terms of a trade organization and trade show uh, for tabletop games. And it generally happens around this time of year, March, April. So the... Um, uh, so I was kind of shy. I know it's hard to imagine. So I, I had a guy working for me <laughs> who was um, really outgoing and friendly and better looking to me. And I told him, hey, Rich, why don't you go to Gamma and go, go there and schmooze with people. And I, I don't want to do all this stuff, you know, and be our sales guy. <laughs> go figure out this whole sales thing for us. And so, um, so he went to Gamma and um, had a fateful meeting with a woman by the name of Lisa Stevens. And uh, so Lisa Stevens at the time was working for a game company called White Wolf, which had recently become quite famous for producing a game series, uh, well, producing a game called Vampire the Masquerade, which is becomes part of the whole world of darkness thing. And it's all gothic horror, playing vampires and werewolves and stuff like that. But they had only published their first book, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, and it was, it was just about vampires then. 
in those days. So she was from that company and was the VP of sales and marketing and her and Rich hit it off. And long story short, she came and uh, she came, moved to Seattle and started working for me. I had a little bit of, I was start, I had started to pay people a tiny salary because I had started raising money from investors to do all this. Um, you know, I was learning how to do this, this business thing. So Lisa came and really changed things for us. She understood how the whole business of games worked and how we could market our games and really how to, and better places than we had thought of for having them printed and how to make terms with distributors and um, uh, all this sort of stuff. And so we, um, and she also brought another entire product line with her. It was a game called Talislana, which had a whole bunch of game supplements. And they had just recently come out of, uh, gone out of business, but the writer had retained rights of in the property and he had all this inventory. And so we made a deal with him to um, do a new edition of Talislana and put the game back in print. So you love it when you hire a salesperson and they bring revenue with them. That's that's a sign of a great salesperson. Wait. So we um we got into this, uh, we started doing this some um, started doing business, started doing these role-playing games. And this was um in 1992 that Wizards of the Coast first published a game. And that game was The Prime Order, which was the the book I described earlier, which I I wrote, co-authored with uh, several, it was a group effort of uh, Beverly and Ken and a bunch of other people. We, we wrote this, this game. And by the numbers of the time, it did fairly well. It did okay. And um, it also established our distribution, established just like every distributor of tabletop games in the world knew who we were. And um, um, we, had, we had arrived, but definitely a small company on the tier of things. And so that, uh, that's kind of what we did. But the other, the other thing that happened in, during this time of while we were getting ready to launch uh, Dungeons and, or, uh, the Primal Order in Talislana, I happened to meet this guy, Richard Garfield. Now, Richard Garfield ended up being the guy that designed Magic the Gathering. This is not the Magic story, so I'm not going to spend much time talking about it. But Magic, um, uh, this became a big opportunity for Wizards of the Coast. And so when our role-playing games came out and did okay, but didn't really have much of a shelf life and you know, just kind of launched okay, and people were like, oh, that's a really good thing. But then you know, just sales slowed down and um, we didn't really have something planned to, to release it. We just had expansions for, for Prime Lawyer and Talis lineup that were, uh, were lined up. And we also ended up in a lawsuit because we had mistakenly, naively, uh, we were thought we we're doing things correctly, but we had used, we had made references in the Prime Lawyer to other companies' intellectual properties. GURPS and RIFs and um, Rollmaster, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and it wasn't the Dungeons and Dragons company, which was separate at the, that, that sued us. It was a, a different one. And this uh, put a lot of strain on us because we were such a small company. And there was a period of time where it looked like we would be going out of business. But just before Magic launched, we managed to settle this lawsuit. And, um, but we still were, were very poor in terms of our, our uh, revenue. We had uh, laid off. We only had part-time employees. Nobody was full-time. And, um, uh, but we, we had Magic out here and Magic looked very promising. And so we, uh, and this is now, now we're up into 1993. So we did, uh, our investors, people that had invested in us, were had lost some confidence in our dream of being a role-playing game company. But people could see something special about, about Magic, and they invested in it. And sure enough, Magic came out, and it was instantly a really huge hit. So the company became um, a runaway success uh, very, very quickly, 1993 to 1995. 
uh, was very rapid growth uh, for uh, for the company, as you can as Magic the Gathering exploded onto the market and uh, became a phenomenon, not just in the United States, but also in Europe and Japan, where our 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 were major markets for us, and we also had some sales in various con- you know countries in South America and uh, Southeast Asia, and so on. And we continued though to try to do role playing games. We had all this money from Magic sales that was helping us do the you know fund fund this company, and so we we kept doing role playing. We were able to use some of that money to keep doing role playing games, but at some point we had to admit that we were doing this for love, but if this was a business, we really shouldn't be doing it. It was not, we were losing money off every role-playing product, every role-playing game that we, that we made. And it was, the challenge was is that wizard had got, wizards had gotten big enough, quickly enough that the types of uh, big, every company can only operate efficiently at a certain, within a certain range. And so we we gotten good at operating at uh, the range where Magic the Gathering was selling, but our role playing games were selling much lower than that, and we were inefficient at doing that. And so, in 1995, I made the um, comment that we were that we we should not be in this business unless we could, unless we were the number one company in the business. A number of our 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 role playing products were not doing well enough to justify us being in this seg- in this segment. So we. So we got out of role playing. We focused on Magic the Gathering primarily and other trading card games that, that we had. And then in um, 1997, so this is two years after that moment, we had the opportunity to buy TSR. So TSR was the game company that um, was associated with Dungeons and Dragons from when it was from its inception in the uh, late uh, in, in the 70s, all the way up until uh, we acquired it in 1997. Uh, the company had fallen on to difficult times. Um, and in fact, there's uh, the their their success story and then their decline and then on, on the verge of bankruptcy, the acquisition of them by us. That story, that, that story of that acquisition is, a, is now a book that Ben Riggs, uh, an, an author, has written this, written this tale in the form of a book. So um, you'll have to, uh, um, he interviewed me several times for it. So some of, uh, so I got to be in his book. <laughs> a few points, uh, it was fun. So the, um, so then, then we ended up back in the role-playing game category. Uh, we ended up uh, uh, with Dungeons and Dragons as the number one game in role-playing. The category made sense for us and the acquisition made sense for us. And uh, it helped our story as a company. Uh, until that time, nothing that we did other than Magic the Gathering had been successful. Um, and uh, but with the Dungeons and Dragons franchise attached to Wizards of the Coast, it meant that we were a two-game company. In fact, two big brands uh, in in one, and that made it attractive. And um, two years after that, we sold the company to Hasbro, and that's why I'm not at Wizards of the Coast anymore. Because at that, that's the point when I uh, when I left. The um. Uh, and then kind of this fun little footnote that happened kind of on our on my way out the door is uh, we, um, uh, yeah, thanks, Aaron. That's exactly the book I was uh, referring to. Yeah. Uh, we had acquired the, the rights to sell Pokemon cards in the United States. And so we played a key role in Pokemon becoming an American phenomena and then a worldwide phenomena. It had started in Japan and it was popular in Japan. And uh, by the time I left um, the company, we had the rights for Pokemon, uh, the card game. We were not involved with the Game Boy or the animated TV series and so forth, but the card point, the card game, the part that made, made the most money. So good. We had the rights to sell it in all countries outside of Japan in all languages except Japanese. So 
that um, uh, and in the last 20 years since then, of course, I haven't been involved. I left the company in 2001. Um, I did buy Gen Con from Hasbro after, because uh, ha uh, when, when we at Wizards bought TSR, the company did Dungeons and Dragons, TSR also did Gen Con, which is a, the tabletop game uh, convention for consumers that's in, in the Midwest every year. And it wasn't at the time, but it is now the largest tabletop game convention in the world. And so that's, um, that's still my, my business and uh, what I, what I do. <laughs> so, um, that's kind of a synopsis of my life in RPGs. I'm happy to, uh, Aaron, somebody, I'm happy to go into questions or I'm happy to elaborate in a certain area. How do I make this, uh, take this and make it for you? Yeah, I, I, that was so wonderful, um, Peter. I was, uh, uh, as a, a, a lifelong fan of all these games, um, it's it's cool hearing the story um, from the horse's mouth. Um, but yeah, usually we just kind of open up the conversation for questions from the room. So um, folks will raise their hands. Um, if you can see them, you can um, call on them, uh, but usually they'll queue in kind of by order. Um, and yeah, just go through them uh, as, as long as you like. <laughs> Okay, ask me anything. I'm all yours. Okay, There's so a puppet that has its hand up. And if, if, if Alexander, is that your hand or is that is that your way of putting up your hand? <laughs> no. I don't think that's uh, Alexander's hand. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll call on people. So um, Erin is the first hand up. Hi, um, I had two questions. Um, the first one was, you kind of talked about your background in like games and just in general, like getting into all this stuff, but do you have any just general advice about game production, like stuff that you learned over the years that you maybe like want to pass on that wisdom? And the second one is, how do you feel about like the D&D &D community as it is now? Because you're not, as you're not like in in it anymore like making it from Wizards of the Coast but like you're still really involved with the community so how do yeah. you like what, any yeah. any stuff sure. like that I think in terms of of making role-playing games I think you um you have all sorts of opportunities for self-publishing that didn't exist back in my day right so you know you can you can make a game and just put it online and 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 build up a, a social media sort of following uh, people that like your work and I think that's a now a very viable way to 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 proceed. In my day, you know, I used to say when I'd be asked this question, I'd say, "Well, you got basically two choices. If you want to be a game, if you want to have be a published designer, you either submit games to game companies, and this would be role playing games or board games or whatever, and uh, and and try to convince them that this game is really great and that they should publish it, and and you'll have to deal with a lot of disappointment." But if you're successful and if they if they take it, they'll pay you money and maybe royalties. Definitely require royalties, and uh, and and then you can relax and go on to the next thing. And and as long as you're not too attached to what they actually do with it, or you can start your own game company. You know, uh, so you know the first one is people like Richard Garfield, Reiner Knizia, and all sorts of game designers who followed that first model. And then there's all sorts of game designers that like, I don't want anybody telling me that I can't make this game. I'm just going to start my own company and make whatever I damn well please. You know, and so you have people like Steve Jackson and Gary Gygax, to be honest, back in the day um, uh, and myself. Uh, so those were kind of the two options. Now, the self-publishing sort of opportunities to you, you now have the technology to create a game just by yourself. I mean, hopefully you play test it with your friends and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that in any of those, one of the key things is getting feedback from people who aren't your friends, but getting, you know, getting people who will be honest with you about um, whether they like the game and uh, whether they enjoy it and so forth. And then, you know, things trying to find someone who will do good illustrations for it, um, building up uh, your social media presence so that, you know, so that you can, you have people to, um, to, to share it with who will go out and promote it and talk about it and play it and, and then supporting, supporting the fans that, that you get. I think that's a, 
um, that's, I think that's a tough road, but I, it's worked for a lot of, you know, a number of people and, uh, it's, it's impressive. I, I, the game community is richer because of that, that, that possibility exists. So speaking of the game community, you know, the, the greatest thing about the game community now versus 1978 is that there are a lot of people who don't look like me, meaning it's not all white dudes, you know, <laughs> you know, so I like the, the, the diversity that's happened in gaming, especially like in the last 10 years, especially, I, I think, as gaming is becoming more um, acceptable, more mass market awareness, more broadly uh, understood, and that has existed long enough. I, I think a lot of people from marginalized communities came into role-playing games maybe 20-ish years ago or so. And um, and now those people have become adults and you have people from these communities creating games for those communities in a way that I never could. I mean, I can't write, you know, the culturally appropriate game on, you know, uh, Southeast Asian mythology or something like that, right? I, I can't do that, right? So that, I like, that is very important and very good about games, uh, about our gaming community. And then the other thing is that with the, with Twitch and YouTube and social media, with the programming that is available now, you have other you have all this, first of all, these amazing ways for people to learn how to play these games. Like back in the day, it was like, how do you explain these games? Well, now it's watch a YouTube video. I mean, it's great. You can watch, you can watch DMs running their game on Twitch live and ask some questions. That's, that's amazing. I mean, that's so cool, right? And so then, and this has created new career opportunities in game because one of the difficult things we've always had in tabletop games is how do you make money at it? How do you make a career in tabletop games? You know, and not that that's an easy path, but the other paths aren't easy either. But the fact that there are more paths, there are more ways that one can uh, create a presence in tabletop games and and become you know and and. And maybe that leads to a job or a career and, and so on. So that that's a great improvement over where we were. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Next. I think Yoon is next. Uh, hi. Hi. Oh, yeah, going back to the part of the talk where you're talking about how you started Wizards of the Coast yeah. um, without a lot of like business knowledge. And you're telling us, yeah, don't do that um what was the biggest what was a really big like learning experience like while running the business that taught you the most about um on the industry and, and working in it that was the most helpful for you mm, wow there's so many because i i made so many mistakes so like every mistake you know i survived by learning you know what what i did you know um i i think in terms of of um business um the just learning what what you know and what you don't know and being honest with yourself about that like what don't i know and and like probing yourself like don't do i understand this and if i don't understand it where, where can i get that information like am i making assumptions about what i know or do i really know or do i don't know and and, and who can i get to help me with this finding people who um are are good people love to tell what to share what they know most people are like here i'm here i'm not getting paid i'm happy to do this i'm happy to spend this time with you and other people are happy to spend time with you as well and and so you know find the people who who are going to root for your success and and share what they know and be honest about what you know and, and go out and find what you what you don't know and 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 that sort of thing I guess that's one thing. By the way, if you ask me tomorrow, I'll say a different answer. Every time I'll say something different because it's, it's freaking hard. It's hard. There's a, there's a lot to it. Yeah, there is a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, if you circle around, just ask me that question again and I'll come up with a different answer. <laughs> um, next in line is Matthew. Matthew. Hi, so I actually had um, 
a couple of questions, but they are all kind of related to each other. Um, so first off, I was curious, what was the reasons why you sold Wizards of the Coast to Hasbro or how they, or how that acquisition went about? Um, what are you working on right now? Or like, what did you work on after you left Wizards of the Coast? And how do you know when it's like your time to just like leave the company and go do something else? Oh yeah, the classic entrepreneurial sort of question. When does an entrepreneurial uh, leave the company? And then when does he realize he left the company um, or sold the company? So for me, it was a, um, I really like smaller companies and being creative and being very hands-on. And Wizards got big enough that, um, that <clears throat> I, I wasn't very, I didn't have much chance to be creative. So I wasn't real happy with my day-to-day -day life at Wizards because I wasn't able, it was too, I was just dealing, dealing with big corporate bureaucracy, bureaucracy type stuff. Um, but the other thing that happened was that we were making a ton of money, which sounds great, and it is, to be have a company that's making a lot of money. But when that happens, the people who are shareholders, people that, you know, I had basically given equity, bits of equity to a whole bunch of people who helped make the company because I didn't have any money. So I had to sell stock to raise money. And then for a lot of people, there's what's called sweat equity, where I would give them stock, stock in the company in exchange for services to the company. Like here, write this book. Here's a thousand shares, that sort of thing. Right. So what happened as the company became successful, nobody cared about these shares in the beginning because nobody thought it was worth anything. Right. And then when magic's taken off and becoming big, everybody's getting out their calculator and figuring out, Hey, I'm worth $2 million or whatever on paper. And like, and then realizing that they can't take that stock down to and buy a car with it or buy a house with it, you know? And so there was pressure for what's called liquidity, which is, which is shareholders saying, Hey, I'm rich on paper, but it doesn't mean anything because I can't do anything about it. Like, like I, buy me out cash out. And so this became a top priority for the company, which means for me as a CEO at the time, uh, the the num the mandate that I was given going, and it, it was like increasingly pressure. It started like around 1995, 1996. And by um, 1998, going into 1999, it was like, okay, this is the year, Peter, get off your butt and you got to find, you got to sell this company or do what's called like a leverage buyout where you and Richard borrow money from a big bank and use, use your stock as collateral and buy everybody else out or, um, or, or something, right? And, or go public. That's the other, often the answer. And so uh, uh, there just really wasn't a choice. I had to do something. And so the, we pursued all those options and some variations of them. And the option that became most attractive was selling the company to Hasbro. And so that's what we did. And I'm, I, I'm happy we did it. It, it was a, a great deal. It was a great deal for all parties. The shareholders got a good deal, made out really well. And um, for a time, it looked like maybe Hasbro had overpaid because after Hasbro took over, they lost the Pokemon license and uh, the sales really dropped down. But then the sales came back up over time. And now uh, now it's become a major part of Hasbro. And uh, again, like it was in 1999. And the um, uh, so, yeah, so that that's why what I did after that is I very quickly on my way out the door, I kind of had this premonition that Hasbro was really happy to buy Wizards of the Coast, but that doesn't mean they're happy with every piece of, of Wizards of the Coast. And so I had asked the people that succeeded me, I said, if Hasbro ever wants to sell off a part of this company, let me know because I know this company really well. And which could be good or bad, depending on what part you're trying to sell. And so I did get that call about a year later and um, uh, got the chance to buy Gen Con. And I'm like, oh, Gen Con, that's really interesting. 
because like I said at the beginning of this, I love Gen Con. I mean, Gen Con is, uh, you know, I grew up thinking of Gen Con as the Mecca. Like this is like someday, I'm living on the West Coast and Gen Con being in the Midwest, you know, as a child, as a teenager, a young adult, never had enough money to go, which made me just want to go more. It was like a dream, a fantasy. Like someday I'm going to make it to Gen Con. And, you know, eventually did 1992 as an exhibitor, selling the Prime Order. Woohoo! And so I loved Gen Con throughout my whole gaming life and then when i had a chance to buy it um i did so i've owned it ever since and so you ask what i'm doing now um i i realized uh, at some point that i wasn't good at running gen con day to day that's like oh it's just cool it's this big party for gamers but really what it is, it's a lot of logistical crunchiness. It's like space planning and registration systems and hotel contracts and uh, stuff like that. So I, I have a guy that runs it for me. And, um, uh, and but I'm involved as of just very recently, uh, newly involved in Gen Con in that I'm running the Gen Con Twitch channel now called Gen Con TV, which uh, his historically without having really much on the channel has built up to a nice modest little uh, setting like 12,000 followers, uh, which in social media terms is not big, but it's not, um, it's not zero. It's nothing, you know, it's, it's something to work from. And so what I'm right now doing is working on uh, building that channel and including, um, I started a, I mentioned earlier, I started a D&D campaign back in 1979 called Chaldea. So I'm doing Chaldea uh, RPG sessions that will be online on Twitch and YouTube. And they're going to be moving to the Gen Con TV uh, Twitch channel in about three weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. I did do a little bit more. I had a game company that I don't tend to talk to about very much, but it's good to know. It's good to acknowledge that. Not all your ideas are winners. <laughs> uh, not everything I've done in business has been a big success. You've probably never heard of a company called Hidden City Games. Yeah, probably never heard of that company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's because it died. <laughs> so I had about 10 years of my life lost to, uh, um, I had this great, I thought this was, um, I thought I could really have an impact of, it was a trading card property for young girls. And it had these beautiful art fantasy horses with these inspirational messages, you know, follow your dreams and beauty comes from within and all this stuff like that. It's this woman game designer in Denmark who'd come up with this game. And um, I thought it was a fantastic idea. It was a fantastic idea, but um, uh, it didn't quite become what, um, uh, what our investors expected it to become. So that ended up being another, um, yeah, story. I don't know if I answered your question or not. I apologize. Oh, you, you did, you did. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. All right, next up is Ed. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Fantastic. Um, so we, you kind of touched about it with a couple of other questions that you were answering, but I just wanted to ask because I'm currently looking at some entrepreneurship stuff myself. And one of the most intimidating things to me is always finding that network and finding those people that are trying to be, that are willing to help you and are, are on your side. Like you mentioned that you met the, the, the editor, Beverly. So like, how are some of the ways that you find those kinds of people that are really beneficial to your company? Yeah. Yeah. You got to put yourself out there. Um, for raising money, I was doing what's called angel investors, which is a name for a type of investor, not a professional investor, like a venture capitalist or an equity firm or a company, but just people that have enough money and say, yeah, I'll give you a couple thousand dollars or whatever. And so to do that, I put together a business plan, you know, looked online, like how do I write a business plan and try to come up with something. And, um, and then I just started pitching it to everybody I knew. I'm, I just literally started telling everybody I knew, hey, it's hard to do. But it's like, hey, I have a game company. I have a company. I'm, I'm, I'm raising money. Would you be willing to listen to my, my pitch? You know, and if, 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 you, if you don't want to invest, maybe you can give me some feedback on the pitch and how I present it and help, you know, just give me your time. I need practice presenting it, you know. Um, and uh, so, you know, neighbors, um, people I worked for, I was working, uh, fortunately, I had a decent job for being fresh out of college. I was working part-time doing data entry at the Boeing company. 
and um, so and there's a lot of Boeing engineers and you know they're geeks and they're just geeks. The gamers were geeks, engineers are geeks. They're just a different type of geek. That's all. And uh, but they're very much like us. And so um, I just and everybody I talked to, I asked them if um, if they knew anybody else I could talk to, if they would introduce me, you know, and somebody, if somebody's just told you, no, I won't give you money. I won't invest some money. They want to give you something. Right. So, oh yeah. Okay. I do, I do know somebody, you know, and, and so it was turning over a lot of rocks and raising money slowly. And it was, I probably spent half of my time as an entrepreneur all the time I've been an entrepreneur until more recently when I've had enough money, I haven't had to go out and raise money. So over about a 15, let's see, no, let me do that. No, about a 25 year period of my life, I probably spent half my time raising money. So not the answer you want to hear because it's, it's uh, but, but that's talking to people and asking other people who to talk to. And when it became, uh, you know, sense wizards, I, I went from just friends and family type investments to actually pitching uh, more sophisticated investors, but it was the same type of thing. It was pitching a lot of different people and, um, and every time if they'd said no, asking for that introduction to somebody else and just talking about it to everybody. I, I ended up selling Wizards of the Coast stock to the janitor at Wizard. So the, one of the janitors, this gal that came in every night, because, you know, I was doing this thing where probably a little inappropriate where, you know, I'm, I'm working at Boeing and I were there all day. And then at night I'm in there using the computer and the printers to, you know, for my role-playing stuff, you know, uh, <laughs> you, you know, just you do what you got to do. Right. And so she would come in there as a janitor and she'd see me in there and, and asked me what I was doing. And we talked, we just became friends every day, we, every night, we, I'd, almost every night, not every night, but I'd see her in there. And one night she just said, hey, could, you're raising money. Could, could I invest in this company? I'm, and I was so torn, like, take money from this janitor, like, who's working so hard and she wanted to invest money and, and I really need the money and she really wanted to. And so I took the money and um and that was a very precise amount it was like one thousand two hundred and fifty three dollars like it was i don't know if that was exactly how much money she had in her bank account i'm not quite sure uh but you know it she ended up getting like two million bucks for it later so i think it, i think she made the right decision definitely sounds like it yeah <laughs> um next up we have ben yeah hi um hi. i know you mentioned Lord of the Rings as one of your major fantasy influences early on and things like Gen Con is something that really got you excited about tabletop games. Were there any other major influences for you, whether early on or later throughout your process, that really impacted your passion for fantasy, for tabletop role-playing games, that sort of thing? You know, uh, not much, really. Like, like I... I went straight from Hobbit to Lord of the Rings to Dungeons and Dragons. And, and I read a few of the other, I mean, I read some, you know, fantasy and pulp fiction of the era, like Conan and H.P. Lovecraft and Moorcock and um, uh, Dragon Riders of Pern and, you know, just a whole bunch. I, I did read a fair amount of fantasy, but really I became a Fritz Lieber. Oh, you can't forget him. I, I think the, the, my love of Dungeons and Dragons fed me as much as anything, and, and especially the world building associated with it. And so, you know, I very quickly moved from creating, uh, from running modules, you know, like I started in 1978 playing D&D &D and running modules. 1979, I started working at Chaldea, which is my homebrew campaign, which I've been working on ever since. So um, I think that it, it, I just found what was this creative um source for me and and then the people that you play with you know your friends your community it's that's a thing and then other role-playing games uh, about the turn of the century i got um some of the non D, &D games started to get really interesting and in what's now called the indie rpg 
uh, movement storytelling games, uh, chamber LARPs, and uh, uh, there's you know this the, some of the types of role playing games, and that um, weren't really around before around around 2000, and so some of those games became very inspirational for me like Sorcerer, My Life as Master, um, just a bunch of games that just kind of came and went and out of that field. Burning Wheel um, is one that um, I've stuck with and it's probably um, that and D&D &D my, are my two favorite games. So that's been a, a source of inspiration uh, for me. And then, you know, everything that comes out on television and movies, that's fantasy. <laughs> Anybody that says Conan the Barbarian wasn't one of the great fantasy movies just, just doesn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> um, next up, we have T. Hey, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, barely. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, okay. I'm in a library again, like I always am, but okay. basically, um, I wanted so I'm actually an education major um but like something that like my school's education program is doing is like looking at like community like based like passion-based learning so like the first thing that popped into my mind was like D&D &D because um like me and some other classmates we really like D&D &D and we know that like at least and I think you mentioned it before, but like the power to like create characters and build worlds, but like with a guide is kind of like, it gives people the ability to like build their own characters and build their own representation, especially for like people of color who don't usually get their own representation. So I guess we just kind of wanted to ask you like, like since you have like, you're so familiar with D&D, &D, like you basically it's like basically like your baby at this point right um we wanted to ask like well what are some things you can you think like students can pull value from D, D? like what is like just something that's intrinsically satisfying that they can carry on like throughout their lives a uh, great question and there's honestly a lot um i think but i'll i'll, I'll mention one thing because it's personal um my, I have a little sister and she's 13 years younger than I am. So I kind of raised her in a lot of ways, you know, um, we, had a, we had a tough situation at home. And um, so I, I uh, and when she was, you know, about seven or eight, you know, I, I, all my friends are coming over and play D&D all the time, of course, you know, and she's like, I want to play D&D, you know, and of course, typical older brother, you know, like I don't want, you know, no, you're too young, you know. And so I, I, I gave her, I, I bought her a player's handbook, AD and &E, AD and D, player's handbook. By the way, if you ever look at AD and D player's handbook, it is a dense read. It is not well written. It's not well laid out. Uh, it is pretty, pretty dense. I gave it to her. I said, "You read this. When you get done reading it, you can play." That became the biggest motivation for reading ever. So you talk about passion feeding an educational value i mean reading is pretty freaking important right um she suddenly took an interest in reading reading comprehension and she did she she didn't lie about it she did she went and read the whole eight, whole player's handbook front to cover that taught her how to read um so i mean there's one example <laughs> of how i think that passion um it, people want to Role playing is so, so much fun. It's so so fun. It's so rewarding. It's so uh, the connections that we make, the, the the imagination, the worlds that we explore, the stories we tell, the things we learn about ourselves. These are all uh, so engaging, and therefore passion feeds that engagement. If you can if you can use that to drag somebody into learning something and growing, um, I think that's that's wonderful. I I'm not an education expert. I, I don't have more insight than that, but I, I certainly have seen that and uh, I'm happy that that's what you're exploring. Thanks, T. Um, next up, we have Erin. Hi, um, just another question. Um, just as 
a question to DM, I guess, because you're talking a lot about like the game that you're currently running and like the world that you currently have. Um, I mean, I think a lot of DMs have kind of struggled with this at times, but like, do you have like homebrew aspects? How do you balance that? Like, I guess, what are your favorite parts of being a DM and how do you kind of go about that? Because everyone kind of has different ways of playing. Oh, yeah. How to DM. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's why I got so excited about um, some of the non D&D games that came out turn of the century because they were really um, looking at different ways the games could be structured. You know, the idea that you have a game like um, that where you give the player the microphone and the player gets to narrate what's happening. You know, that, that didn't exist, you know, in any, not in any commercially successful uh, vehicle uh, be before, you know, 1999 or so. And then, um, uh, so, you know, I don't know. I, I've been doing it so long, it's hard to explain what I do. And I don't think I'm particularly great at it, but to be honest, I mean, I do it. I think one thing, I, I guess one advice is to, I, I, you know, I've, I'm glad you asked this because, you know, I've had a number of people that I've talked to in the last couple of years who have, who seem to have worry about DMing, worry about like, am I doing it well? Like, how do I do it right? Pe you know, people who are struggling with this and, um, I said, well, <laughs> you know, dive in and just do it. I mean, it, it, it first of all, it's, it, the DMing skill, it's, it's, it's like muscles, you know, it's like working on your abs, you know, how do you get stronger abs? Work on your abs, right? Those are biceps. Let's see, obviously I'm not, uh, but, you know, I, I think you learn to DM by DMing to, to be, to not to be, you know, you know, sort of pedantic about it, but just do it. Love it. Love storytelling. Love your character. Love your players. Listen to, you know, listen to them, trying to figure out what they want to do, um, you know, work on the world, um, react to what they're doing. And um, no, I don't know. I don't know. How to, it's, it's, it's one of the most beautiful uh, things that you can do is, is to DM and lots of people do it differently. Don't, don't think you have to imitate what somebody else is doing. Find, find your own way of doing it if nobody plays nobody's going to play with you okay then maybe you're doing it maybe maybe you need to think about it <laughs> but if people like your game you know so we played um we played star crossed fiasco and like honey heist as like a requirement oh also um the quiet year as like a requirement in this class it was yeah. like a lot of fun because it was kind of non-traditional ttrpg where there's no dm and you kind of like do it on your own which was really interesting but uh, just as a connective question, what, what's your favorite part of d and I know that's kind of vague, but just in general. Well, um, I, like, uh, I like designing, uh, just trying to, the plot. Oh, creating, you know, the, there's the world, but then it's, you know, the, you put the characters in it, then it comes to life. And the players come in and start creating their characters. And then you start developing the world around them and developing working with them on their backstory and what their motivations are and and putting things out there for them to explore and engage with uh i've i've never done much with modules like you know like forgotten realms modules you know because to me i i, I don't I'm not that big a fan of doing something on rails they call it you know we're like okay this is an adventure and you've got to you're always trying to encourage the players to go in the direction you want to more like just like to throw out a bunch of strings i call them just like you know a, a string that, that if you pull on the string then you'll, you'll find some adventure or pull on a different string and find some other adventure i always feel like i want the players to have some agency some choice about what they're that they made the decision the that, that got them to wherever they're at the series of decisions and I always feel like I'm, as a DM, I always want to put more strings out there than they can possibly. It's like when you play an MMO and all the town people are giving you quests and you can't do them all because there's too many. And for some reason, I find that really frustrating in an MMO. I don't really play them very much. But in, I like to DM that way uh, just, to, just to give them those options. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.
I, I inserted myself into the queue because um, I have a question or so. Um, so I think um, I didn't tell you this before you came, but um, the, the class's final project is actually a world building project. It's more of like create a world for a role playing game setting, not create a role playing game. And so I guess I was curious if you had any advice for the students in this class um, for how to do world building well. Ooh, ooh. Well, I think there's a lot of ways to do it. For me, I, I like to draw a map. <laughs> I like the I like the cartography um, of it. I I'm not good at it, but I'm passable at cartography. I've learned it along the way. I actually I learned it from a couple of TSR um, when we bought TSR and I was out in Lake Geneva wandering around the office and I ran into these two guys. And they just happened to be the only two employees I hadn't met yet. And they were the only people in there working on the weekend and they were the cartographers. And so, you know, I just, uh, uh, I was like, oh my God, I always wanted to be able to draw maps. And so they said, well, sit down, we'll teach you how to do it. And I spent the whole day in their area, which was a weird little like industrial type era area in a bigger office building, like their ducts and stuff. I don't know what the hell kind of room it was. And they taught me how to make fantasy map for the end of the day I was passable at it and I've gotten a little better since then and the funny part is I had no idea who I was I was just like the, they had no idea I was the new owner I just this guy had wandered into their workspace and wanted to learn how to draw maps so I I don't know that's that's one thing um and then because then you know that leads you to thinking about what makes sense in terms of what a map looks like you know the, the, the river should flow from the mountains to the sea there should only be forks going into the way the river is flowing, not <laughs> the other way. The forest should be near the water. You know, you start thinking about all this stuff and the world itself starts to take shape. And then in your mind, for me, then my mind starts thinking about who are the people that are here. And, um, you know, I, I went, um, I love history. So for me, this is not, not everybody might want to do this for sure, right? There's many different ways of designing a fantasy world. But for me, and I think this is somewhat perhaps reflective of my generation, I love history. And so when I became sort of aware of how important it is to be multicultural and that the world should represent all sorts of different ethnicities and, um, and so on, um, which wasn't, you know, it wasn't the way I was raised. Um, I in my love of history, I started dividing up the world into areas that were inspired by specific places in real world place and time. So for me, world building became a way of combining my love of fantasy with my love of history. And so I say, okay, let's, let's have this area based on sort of Neo Babylon, seventh century BC, but then let's add fantasy components and, you know, make it, make it cool. And then over there in this area, you know, let's, let's, you know, do, do whatever. I have a particular fascination with Middle Eastern history. So I love all sorts of um, uh, the, you know, the, the Hittites and the Nubians and the Egyptians and the Amorites and all sorts of stuff like that. So a lot of Middle Eastern history. In fact, the name of my world is Chaldea, which is uh, historically a era of Babylon was ruled by the Chaldeans, which is roughly where Kuwait is now. That's just my, my way of doing world, uh, world building that you know certainly that's just that's that's just me i don't know that's great um we have a question from matthew and then we'll probably have space for one or two more questions after that in case anybody wants to queue in all right matthew so uh the professor actually already asked the main question i had which was about world building <laughs> so i guess i'll go with another uh, to, i have another question along the same vein is, what is your biggest struggle when world building? Is it that you, like you were talking about how you try and make sure it's all representative and you combine all your passions um, such as history into it? Is it like, is there anything that you struggle with the most when fleshing out the whole world? Yeah, for me, I would say it's, um... Uh, well, I do struggle with wanting to be um, inclusive and not be sort of, you know, inappropriate in some way, right? So there's there's that, right? And separating, there is, you know, the world has horrible things in it. And so there's there's weird to like in one day, want, in one way wanting to 
um, embrace um, appropriate values for where we would like society to evolve. And then, oh, but here I have a fantasy world set in medieval times and people were really freaking nasty to each other back then, you know? So that's something like to have that line between like, when am I being very inappropriate? And I know I'm creating people who are maybe inappropriate. The other thing is um, what me and my, I have a business partner, the two of us, is we're business and creative partners. And, um, and we have this idea we call JIT Dev. JIT Dev is just-in-time development, which is kind of a spoof off of just-in-time inventory, which is business manufacturing sort of practices. And it is a discipline of not overdeveloping things because you can go down rabbit holes and develop too much, in my opinion, at least for us um, and what we want to do, where then that can kind of, uh, when somebody has a story they want to tell, the story is more important than the world. That's, that's a, I, maybe that's actually what I should have said earlier. And that, that, is, uh, that is more important than the world. The stories, that's what we're here for, is to tell these stories and create these characters and learn through these characters and have these characters interact. Nobody buys a world until they've become, they've fallen in love with a story. You know, so people interested in Middle Earth because of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. People are interested in Westeros, you know, because of Game of Thrones, right? That nobody, if you just publish a world, nobody's really gonna want it until they've fallen in love with some characters. And so when those character stories start to emerge, you don't want to have been so tedious and complete and thorough in your world building that, that you can't figure out how to cram their story into all this stuff that doesn't really doesn't really matter to you. So so I I'm, I'm a fan of what we call just in time development, which is like give the the jet dev just get, do enough to provide a framework, stuff that inspires. And again, I go back to maps because I I'm one, uh, one thing I love about D and D is you know like uh, I used to play a lot of D and D where, but it's my role is somebody else's. We just get out the map and say where do you want to go? Like I have no idea what's there, but it's like you know the the weather hold uh, chasm. Oh, what's what's there? I want to go there. Let's go. You know stuff like that. So anyway. That's me. Uh, wonderful answering that question. I think this will be our last question, Alexander. Um, uh, hello, Mr. Atkinson. Uh, I just have a question about your personal experience. How much time do you think uh, you might spend for brainstorming when you create the core of the game uh, without uh, all small details? And how do you feel that when you got an uh, idea and it would be the game, like triple A game. Okay, so brainstorming, I think is very powerful in business. Uh, I love brainstorming and it often, uh, brainstorming often leads to interesting ideas and solutions for problems. I think that the initial spark of creativity for some interesting idea I think often though comes from an individual who just has this creative eureka sort of moment. And, and so I think sometime in the earliest stages of, of, a, of a concept of creating a new idea, too much brainstorming and bureaucracy and committees, these things destroy good ideas often more than create you know i um the the brainstorming comes is most valuable i think once an idea has taken root in an organization in a group and there's a respect for this idea and then how do we nurture this idea and get it to grow and um and, and bear fruit or if, or if an organization a company is struggling to figure out how to find its way brainstorming is really good but i, I think the best ideas for games dungeons and dragons dave arneson i don't know that he had much help coming up with dungeons and dragons i think he just came up with it and then gary gygax saw it 
and ran with it and published it. Richard Garfield came out with Magic, uh, excuse me, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, yeah. Richard Garfield came out with Magic the Gathering while he was walking along up by Multnomah Falls in Oregon. He was just walking along and suddenly it came to him. It's like yeah, this idea, right? So there you go. It was great to spend this time with you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, please, everybody, join me in giving uh, Peter a big round of applause. Um, thank you so much for coming, um, sharing your insight, your wisdom. Um, I, it's uh, yeah, it's it, an honor to have you here um, and sharing all this with the class. So, um, thank you. I'm gonna with that. I'm gonna stop the report. Oh, one last question. I always ask this. Um, it's okay to say uh, if it's tough, but um, is there an email that people can reach you at if they want to, to ah. reach you after the class? Yeah, sure. Peter at GenCon.com. Should I okay, put that in? Good. Should I put that in chat? Yeah, please. Uh, is that chat? Yeah. Yeah, I can't type, especially when everybody's watching. There All right. Go. So, so there we, we have it. If anybody wants to reach out to Peter to ask him any questions, um, yeah. now that we've had this talk, please, please do. Um, he's there and he's wonderful. So. That I will stop the recording. All right.